became shorter. <laughs> it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the 2012 Ashkenaz Festival. My name is Rachel Zelig, and I'm thrilled that you've joined us for this evening's talk, Australia, the Yiddish Community of Melbourne, by Ms. Freydi Mroki, or as she's told me to pronounce it in Yiddish, Mrotsky. Before we begin, I would like to thank Ashkenaz's loyal family of donors, headed up by Isidore and Rosalie Sharp, and the Zuckerman Family Foundation. Ashkenaz would also like to acknowledge the generous assistance of its numerous government and private sector sponsors, and to thank our co-producer, Harborfront Center, and our lead partners, the UJA Federation of Greater Toronto, Canadian Heritage, Ontario Arts Council, the Toronto Arts Council, the Ontario Trillium Foundation, and Canada Council for the Arts. Yeah. Uh, thank you all for helping us make sure that the Ashkenaz Festival is such a success. Thank you to all of the Harborfront Center's partner sponsors and donors who make these events possible. Summer at Harborfront Center is brought to you by people like you. If you would like to support free events at Harborfront Center, please visit the information desk to make a donation today, or text FREE to 30333 to donate $5 to Harborfront Center right now through your phone bill. Uh, tonight's presentation is sponsored by the Al and Malka Green Yiddish Studies Program at the University of Toronto and the Jewish Foundation of Greater Toronto. As the Ray D. Wolf Postdoctoral Fellow in Jewish Studies, it is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's event on behalf of the University of Toronto. We take pride in sharing the vision of the Ashkenaz Festival by offering courses that convey the richness of Yiddish and Jewish culture. This fall, for example, I will be teaching a course entitled, Where is Yiddish Land? This question is not easy to answer. Yiddish language and culture flourished all over the world in places as far apart from each other as Warsaw, Vilna, Moscow, Montreal, New York, and even, as tonight's speaker is here to teach us, Melbourne, Australia. I want to take this opportunity to tell you Yiddish enthusiasts about an exciting upcoming event that I've organized which touches upon this very theme. The Symposium Jewish Literature Beyond Borders will take place at the University of Toronto on October 18th. Scholars from all over North America have been invited to present their research on Yiddish and Hebrew writers and the cultures with which they came into contact. A keynote address will be offered by Dan Miron, the extraordinary scholar of Yiddish and Hebrew literature and recipient of the Israel Prize. Please be sure to pick up the flyer, which I've left uh, on the table, on your way out. This promises to be a very exciting event. And now it is my distinct pleasure to present tonight's speaker. And I have to apologize to my former Yiddish teacher, Avon Lichtenborn, Simon Meuchel, and doing it all in English. Uh, we are very lucky to have Melbourne's own Freydi Votsky here with us. Freydi is a Yiddish teacher, performer, and singer with the Australian klezmer band Klezmania, and is the first Australian artist to be presented at the Ashkenaz Festival. She will provide an overview of Australian Jewish history, focusing particularly on the cultural life of Melbourne's Yiddish community. So please, without any further ado, please help me in welcoming Mrs. Ms. Kredi Mlotsky. Shalom Dank, thank you very much. Um, if I get my better nascent of English, so for all of you who may be quivering that this is going to be a Yiddish um, presentation, it won't be. But it is about Yiddish. Um, Australia, or Australia, is considered the world's largest island continent. Its location, well, in the colourful words of one of our former Prime Ministers, Australia can be found at the arse end of the world. <laughs> Hence the Yiddish expression, Australia ek wird, is more than apt. Australia is roughly the same size and area as mainland USA and is divided into six states and two territories. We are a country with a big empty heartland, which is either desert or sparsely populated bush or farmland. The majority of the Australian 
uh, population resides in large urban centres dotted along our coastline. Given the old Yiddish um, adage, Vies kristelt sich, also yiddelt sich, it is not surprising that most Jews do too. We are currently a country of some 23 million people, predominantly white and of European origin. As for our Jewish population, the latest census reports that there are just under 100,000 Jews in Australia, which is 0.05 of the population. Um, many of our larger cities have small Jewish populations ranging from a few hundred to 5,000 and struggle to maintain their Jewish schools and institutions. By far the biggest and most dynamic Jewish communities are Sydney, with a population of 40,000 Jews, and Melbourne, with a Jewish population of 45,000 Jews. Since the early years of our nation, a deep rivalry has existed between these two major cities. I understand a similar rivalry exists here between Montreal and Toronto. While our rivalry is an acknowledged fact of Australian mainstream life, I am actually of the opinion that there is also a vast difference between the Jewish communities of these two cities. And it does the Rechenen in the Berta. I'm going to be very careful because there's a Sydney aunt sitting right here in this audience who's going to keep me honest. Let me state my bias from the outset. I love Sydney as a holiday destination. I am a proud Melbourneian, and it's not by accident that we have once again been voted most livable city in the world. I'm also a proud and active member of the Melbourne Jewish community. Call me parochial, but I'm now going to give you an unashamedly partial and non-active <coughs> assessment of these two communities. Since the major wave of Jewish migration to Australia in the first half of the 20th century, Melbourne has sometimes been referred to as the shtetl on the Yellow River, acknowledging its Eastern European links and also perhaps the old-fashioned ways of its largely Polish uh, <coughs> population, Jewish population. The Melbourne Jewish community prides itself on being active and diverse, boasting more than 10 Jewish day schools. And actually, I've been told that that number is wrong, that we're closer to 12 because there are a number of very ultra-Orthodox community uh, schools as well. Which is fairly remarkable when you think about it. We have 45,000 Jews and 10 to 12 Jewish day schools. These range from the secular Jewish school Shalom Aleichem College through to the ultra orthodox Satma school Adas Israel. It is estimated that more than 75% of Jewish children attend a Jewish day school. In general, Melbourne is a deeply Zionist and traditional community, and which from the outside seems reasonably cohesive. Most Jews in Melbourne live in suburbs quite close to each other. In my opinion, Melbourne Jews would like to think that if you don't make Aliyah to Israel, their city with over 40 congregations and over 200 organisations offers the possibility for the rich Jewish communal life that the shtetl once offered. I have to pause, there's another, another Sydney Jew in the room as well, because <laughs> now I'm going to launch into Sydney. <laughs> to us in Melbourne, Sydney is all glitz and glamour, and gorgeous sun-drenched days on Bondi Beach. You could do worse. <laughs> and if you note the, uh, the Father Christmas hats, that's because that's how we celebrate Christmas, on the beach. When I was growing up, Sydney Jews were seen as being more Germanic and assimilated, or were called mudgers, reflecting Sydney's largely Hungarian post-Holocaust population. More recently, South African Jews are having a big influence on Jewish communal life there. Also significant is the physical divide. There are two distinct Jewish communities on either side of Sydney Harbour Bridge. Yes, Sydney has an active Jewish community with six Jewish day schools and many congregations and community groups. Like Melbourne, it also has a general focus towards Israel. 
But I believe even Sydney signers would acknowledge that it does not have the depth and diversity of Melbourne. Crucial to this discussion, Yiddish and Yiddish culture is almost non-existent in Sydney. So how did all of this come about? Now that I've given you a brief <coughs> overview of Australian Jewish communities today, let's enrol in Australian Jewish History 101, The Crash Course. While Australian Aborigines have inhabited Australia for 45,000 years, the story of Jewish Australia actually begins with white settlement. Like Canada, Australia has a history of British colonisation. And like Canada, as a result, we are, to this day, members of the British Commonwealth. The Queen is our head of state. However, our past is more unsavoury than yours. After being so-called discovered by James Cook in 1770, Australia became the dumping ground for England's underclasses who were overcrowding British jails. Crimes were petty, judgments were harsh. One could be convicted for stealing a loaf of bread. In the late, me, in the late 1780s, transportation to Australia became an alternative to hanging for such paltry offences. The first convicts arriving in Botany Bay in 1788 included 14 Jewish convicts. These were petty thieves and larcenists in the very beginning of white settlement. Ike Solomon, on whom it is believed Charles Dickens based his legendary character Fagin, was sent to chains in, to Australia on a subsequent fleet. In all, more than 1,000 Jewish convicts were sent to Australia before transportation ended in the mid-19th century. After serving their sentences, many convicts decided to stay on in the colony because of the opportunity they thought it offered. In 1816, free Jewish settlers began to arrive. Unlike many countries in Europe at the time, Australia accorded Jews the same social, economic and political opportunities as other free settlers and former convicts. The early Australian Jews rose to the heights of social and economic success. For example, Esther Abrahams, a former convict sent to Australia for stealing a bolt of lace, became the unofficial First Lady of New South Wales as wife of Lieutenant Governor George Johnson. Jewish communal life emerged quickly in both Melbourne and Sydney. With the discovery of gold in the 1850s, fortune hunters arrived in Australia from all around the world, including several thousand Jews. In the ensuing economic boom, Jews played a large role in trade and commerce, and until this day, continue to have an active role in politics as Lord Mayors, local city councillors and parliamentarians. Australia has had two Jewish Governors General. By Federation in 1901, there were around about 15,000 Jews in Australia, largely of English origin and keeping their identity discreet in both senses of the word. They defined themselves as members of the British Empire, but of the Hebraic persuasion. <laughs> Consequently, when 3,000 Russian and Polish Jews escaped to Australia from pogroms and persecutions at the end of the 20th century, the established Jewish community feared that the presence of these obviously foreign Jews would provoke, sorry, would provoke anti-Semitism. Wishing to preserve the British character of the nation, the Australian government was also concerned about the mass migration of foreigners. In the 1930s, Annual quotas were placed on the number of Jews entering the country. Still, from 1938 to 1939, 7,000 German and Austrian Jews seeking refuge from Nazi persecution were admitted to Australia. Some notoriously and absurdly found themselves interned in Australian POW camps because they were suspected of being Nazi sympathisers and enemy aliens. At this time, the Australian Jewish community 
was being transformed. For many of the new European Jewish migrants, Jewishness was not just about Jewish faith. It involved a cultural sense of identity and not just a religious one. This included a commitment to secular political ideologies such as socialism and Jewish nationalism. We'll look more closely at this period from the 1930s in the next part of the presentation because this era saw the establishment of many of the Jewish and Yiddish cultural and educational institutions and organisations. Yiddish cultural life blossomed in Melbourne. At the same time, there was a wholesale shift in Melbourne's religious landscape with the growth of Eastern European orthodoxy as opposed to the prevailing top-hatted British style of religious worship. And I have to say that continued until the early 1990s, where there was still in one particular shul, the functionaries all wore top hats. It was really quite absurd. <laughs> anyway, this is also the time of the 1930s when the German Jews brought the Jewish reform movement to Australian shores. Anglo-Jews were not interested in Zionism, but European Jews joined Australian Zionist organisations in great numbers. When the Zionists in the outside world were discussing options for Jewish colonies in existing nations such as Uganda and Alaska, the territorialists also proposed the idea of a Jewish settlement in the Kimberley, a remote rocky wilderness in northwestern Australia. I guess you might need to be Australian to appreciate the astonishing nature of this proposal. But if this plan had been realised, I might be talking to you today as a citizen of the modern Jewish state of the Kimberley, where Yiddish, the mother tongue, was blended with local Aboriginal words <laughs> and our disgusting Aussie vows. Get Morgan, mate. Vafa, get filled and shrimp off from Barbie. <laughs> In the space of 30 years, Australian Jewry travelled from a tiny 23,000 to over 60,000 Jews. Between 1933 and 1961, 35,000 Jewish immigrants arrived. The majority were survivors of the Holocaust. Melbourne has the highest proportion of Holocaust survivors outside Israel. Desperate to affirm life, they were intent on rebuilding their lives and their shattered communities in a new country free of anti-Semitism. They arrived in such large numbers and with such a brain, such impetus. In my opinion, this lies at the heart of what makes Melbourne so dynamic, setting it apart from so many Jewish communities nationwide and indeed worldwide. Still today, the memory and psychological impact of the Holocaust are ever-present, even for second and third post-Holocaust generations. The establishment of the State of Israel in 1948 was seen by many as both a necessity and a source of Jewish pride after the Holocaust. Zionist organisations were widely supported. It is indeed ironic that at a time when there was such an overwhelming influx of Yiddish speakers, so much so that non-Yiddish speakers were forced to learn Yiddish in Melbourne to get by in their new home. This did not translate into mass desire to pass Yiddish on to the next generation. Though there were fervent borrowers of Yiddish books and passionate attendees of the local Yiddish theatre, there was a disconnect. The Yiddish institutions established in the 1930s had a whiff of the Bund about them, and the Bund was seen as being anti-Israel. Consequently, those individuals and institutions that had a strong Bundist Yiddishist connection were marginalised and even publicly maligned. For many Australian Jews, a connection to contemporary Israeli culture now became part of their Jewish identity. Hebrew language, education and culture were highly valued and Yiddish held in low esteem. And so this was for many decades and all through the years of my growing up. In the broader Jewish community, I either felt like a pariah or at best misguided 
or just plain weird. However, there is a recent phenomenon, and one I thought I would never see. There is a self-reflection taking place, a reflection and an appreciation of Melbourne's uniqueness by its own. Just as the last generation of great community leaders is dying out, there are those within mainstream Jewish Melbourne who are keen to acknowledge the people and organisations that contributed so much to the Yiddish flavour of the city. Their aim is to educate the current, current generation and to record our history for posterity. Some hardened and long-suffering Yiddishisten who for decades felt scorned and unappreciated by the Anglo and then Zionist mainstream might say that it is too little, too late. But recent visitors to our city, such as Professor David Cutts, were bowled over. Well, wait a minute, was that a cricket term? Bowled over? Well, okay, were bowled over well, so he was gobsmacked. Gobsmacked to see the exhibition at the Jewish Museum of Australia entitled Mama Loshen, How Yiddish Made a Home in Melbourne. This exhibition, sensitively curated by Anna Epstein, celebrated the history and contribution of Melbourne's Yiddishisten and the organisations they so lovingly cultivated from their inception until today. Yiddish was introduced as a Year 12 subject at high school level and enjoyed a brief renaissance, being taught in six of our ten Jewish day schools. In recent years, the Australian Centre for Jewish Civilisation at Monash University I'll call it by its acronym, ACJC, it's much easier, has included a study of Yiddish, a welcome addition to its usual biblical, Hebrew, Holocaust and Israel menu. They have published a research booklet called Yiddish Melbourne Towards a History and set up a website dedicated to the history of Yiddish Melbourne. Last year, the ACJC published a book called A Shtetl in Eckfeldt, 54 stories of growing up in Jewish Carlton. The dedication page includes, I'm sorry, the following. To lovers of Yiddish who brought their love with them to Carlton and Melbourne. I have to explain something. I've noticed since being in Toronto that you call the suburbs those things that are an hour and a half away out of the Toronto city centre. We are, we have a CBD, and within maybe a mile or two miles out of that radius starts our collection of suburbs, of which we have hundreds of them. So, Carlton is an inner city suburb north of the Yarra, the Yarra River. It is one kilometre from the CBD. And this was the heart of Jewish life in Melbourne from the 1920s to the 1950s. In those days, it was home to working class people and immigrants akin to the Lower East Side of New York. It was close to the factories and the Queen Victoria Market, where many immigrants found employment. Today, it is gentrified, trendy, and expensive. And though very few Jewish families now call Carlton home, the warm, safe shtetl that was Carlton is remembered with affection by those who live there. While editing the Book of Carlton Memories, Julie Meadows was inspired to write a Yiddish song about Jewish Carlton of old, and she asked me to sing it at the launch, and so I'm going to sing it to you now, without accompaniment, but with a swig of water. And, um, we on? My father grew up in Carlton, and there's a gentleman also sitting here in the audience, Mr. Josh Goldhar, and he also grew up in Carlton, and his way of greeting me today was, Khan the Blues, which is our football team. Australian rules footy, it beats there in the heart. And that's why, I suppose it's the same thing, why so many um, Jewish people in England barracked for Arsenal, because it was the Jewish area of old. It's the same thing in Carlton. In Melbourne, you barrack at Carlton or St Kilda because that's where the Jews lived. So, this is to my Alter Hennstadt, or my father's actually in Carlton. Given a mola shtetl in Eckveld, wo Yiddish hart geklungen in die 
gegassen. In so Häume, in Chaläume, in Geschrei und in Gesang. Mama loschen sie's wie Zuckerläufen zu. Mama loschen sie's wie Zuckerläufen der zu. Sie ist da, der Wind, was bläst er weg die Ohren. Zeit der Wind ist, was bläst jede Sache weg. Die Tag, die Nacht, die Kerl, die gelbe Blätter. Verschwinden sie und kommen nicht zurück. Die Tag, die Nacht, die Kerl, die gelbe Blätter. Verschwinden sie und kommen nicht zurück. Und was ist von Herrn Städterle verblieben? A Städterle geschaffen in Eckwelt. Läuft das, was ist geblieben in Sikoren? An Eutzel, was ist Teile von Geld? Läuft das, was ist geblieben in Sikoren? An Eutzel, was ist Teile von Geld? An Eutzel nicht passiert noch war die Dores. Die Meisacht der Zählungen und Schriften von Kinderjahren Golene in Karten. Das Kinder seine Zeit nicht gering vernichten. Von Kinderjahren Golene in Karten. Das kennt die seine Zeit nicht gering vernichten. I'm sorry, when I made the slideshow, I didn't know what size the screen was. Would you like me to read the translation of the words? Yes. Of people at the back? Yes. Yeah, okay. Sorry, you people up the front don't have a say in this. We are very egalitarian in Australia. There's no favouritism, no, no class structure here. No front people get it easier and better than the back people. Okay, Carlton Song, Words and Music by Julie Meadows. There was once a shtetl at the end of the world where Yiddish rang out in the streets, in our memories, in our dreams, in our shouting, in our songs, Mama Loshin sweet as sugar on the tongue. There is a wind that blows away the years. The years of time drive everything away. Our yesterdays, the yellow leaves of autumn, they vanish, never to return. And what has remained of this shtetl? A little shtetl founded at the end of the world. Only that which can be found in recollection, a treasure no money can buy. A treasure not to hoard, but for the generations. The stories that are told and written down of golden childhood days we spent in Carlton. That is something time, the foe, cannot destroy. She's really beautiful song. Um, I was actually taken around a bit around Toronto, and uh, I imagine that this song would probably resonate with those of you who grew up in the Kensington market areas, I think. It's a similar sort of lifestyle of families living together, of mishpochas actually being the whole street, perhaps, um, where people spoke Yiddish to each other and led very rich, even though poor but struggling lives. So what is this world of Carlton, this Yiddish world? When did it start? The history of Yiddish-speaking Jews in Australia can be said to date from the establishment of the Kadima. It began as a Jewish library in 1911 in a building in the city centre and had a Zionist progressive Welt Anschauung. Its purpose was to provide an oasis for the culturally starved immigrant, a familiar home that over the years adapted to meet the needs of the Melbourne Jewish community. The Kadena's most colourful years was when it was located in that suburb of Carlton. The remarkable building that the poor but passionately committed immigrant community erected there in 1933 has been described by many as a secular temple, and it really looks it. Education, politics, literature, theatre, all had a home in the Kadima, where a wealth of culture grew alongside bitter disputes over ideology and language. In the early years, there were struggles between the Anglo-Hebraists Yiddishist elements, 
There were debates between traditionalist, bourgeois, socialist, and even Bolshevist advocates. There were fiery battles between Zionists and Bundists over language and culture and the interpretation of Jewish values. And as a result, there were many splits. But I'm sure this is what happens where Jews are all over the world. And the splits mirrored the worldwide political turmoil of the first half of the 20th century. But the Kadima was to become less of a political and more of a cultural, educational and social institution. It housed various theatre groups, vitally important for the Yiddish-speaking community. It held packed out lectures and literary events. It generated enduring Yiddish schools and choirs, a chess club, social events and a publishing arm. The Kadima produced its own monthly journal and in 1937 published the first Australian Yiddish almanac. Edited by the poet Melachavich, this was the first Yiddish book to be published in Australia. The Kadima became a meeting place for Yiddish writers and hosted numerous literary events. After the Holocaust, its membership swelled. For the year 1954, its library registered 6,000 book loans. <coughs> the Kadima could now afford to bring to Melbourne guest lecturers and artists, including Yankov Pat, Avram Sutskeva, Shimon Chigan, Sigmund Tulkov, Ida Kaminska, Shmuel Atzmon, Dov Noy, Michael Alpert, and your own Eugene Ogenstein, to name but a mere handful. Meanwhile, following demographic trends, the Kadima crossed south of the river to Elstonwick, where Jews now resided in the leafier beachside suburbs of St Kilda, Elwood, and Caulfield. And in 1966, its membership swelled to 1,500. In 1968, the Kadima's cultural journal, the Melbourne Abletter, the Chronicle, appeared. In 1984, the Wednesday Club, a social group for seniors, was formed. The Wednesday Club still exists today, and 44 years later, the Chronicle for, 90, for 2012 has been published characteristically in both Yiddish and English and it was launched just before I left two weeks ago. It's a bumper edition. It's really amazing to celebrate the uh, centenary of the Kadena. Um, you're welcome to have a look at it, but you can't take it, because I'm giving it to Eric Stein, the director of the festival. <laughs> um, 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 um. But of course, you could send across for one. You could order one, they could post you one. Okay, I'm really a salesperson. I'm um, the Yiddish Evening Reading Circle was formed in 1991 and it meets weekly and two weeks ago a new reading circle that meets during the day just began. <coughs> the Kadima was and still is the venue for concerts of music and Yiddish song, from art song to klezmer, with overseas performers such as Mike B Bushton, the Burstein, Theodore Bickel and Michael Albert, as well as local soloists and klezmer groups such as the band Klezmania, with whom I have performed for 20 years. In the last two decades, the Kadima has been involved in such initiatives as the Gilligich Foundation, which, like Aaron Lansky's National Yiddish Book Centre, collects Yiddish books and distributes them around Australia and overseas. One venture, which sadly is no more, is the In One Voice concert in the park. I can't tell you how similar it is um, in concept to Ashkenaz, though certainly didn't have the depth and the ability to bring out overseas acts. But this was a huge community festival of music and culture with an accent on Yiddish. The In One Voice Festival was presented for a period of 18 years in association with the Skiff Youth Movement. This was the single largest Jewish community event in Melbourne, drawing up to 15,000 people, just over one third of the local population. Today, the Kadima is the, one of the co-sponsors of Yiddish Sofoch, an annual Yiddish immersion weekend. Together with the newly formed Yiddish Australia, they hosted events such as the High Society concerts. A number of exciting one-off projects have included the support for Zuftik Theatre Group, both in Melbourne and its tour to Montreal for last year's Yiddish Theatre Festival. The Kadima is currently celebrating its 100th year. Speaking objectively, it is not an institution that has mainstream appeal in Melbourne. While I am a card-carrying member, its membership is mostly elderly 
and has greatly declined in number. Young people in particular question the Kadima's relevance in their lives. So its leadership is looking towards the future and how it can best meet the needs and interests of the community while staying true to its Yiddish cultural roots. The Kadima has much to celebrate and can be proud of its achievements. Perhaps its biggest contribution was its role in providing Yiddish theatre to a community that craved the Yiddish to Arte. Right through the 20th century, there were Yiddish theatre groups in Melbourne. The Yiddish theatre was blessed with many fine artists, women and men who came to our shores to make a better life, or chose exile to escape persecution. Then there were those who joined their ranks by accident. Two of our greatest actors simply happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time, or maybe it was the right place in the right time. It was to our great fortune that two stars of the European Yiddish stage, Lochel Holzer and Janke Weisslitz, were coincidentally both on tour in Australia just before the Second World War. Both had played with great companies of the European Yiddish stage, such as the Vilna Torpe. Both had performed with the greatest actors and directors of the time. Holzer was in demand on the Polish stage and was in the first Yiddish talkie made in Poland. Both were mesmerizing actors and on the top of their game who frequently toured the world and both found themselves stranded in Australia at the outbreak of the, world, of the war while on tour. As Tina Turner said, they were simply the best. They were the Laurence Olivier and Vivian Lee of their day, and they were ours. <laughs> Naturally, Janka Weisslitz and Alohal Holzer had starring roles on the Melbourne Yiddish stage for many years. They both toured overseas after the war, but Melbourne remained their home. Weisslitz and Holzer were joined by other great actors after the Holocaust. Surviving Auschwitz, Weisslitz's daughter, Mila, also formerly with the Vilna Truppe, migrated to Melbourne with her actor husband, Moshe Potashinsky. Together, they staged five plays in 1951, selling 7,000 tickets. These were the golden years of Yiddish theatre in Australia. Rocha Levita, actress on the Melbourne Yiddish stage for 50 years, had this to say about the time. When the immigrants after the war heard that Yiddish theatre still exists at the other end of the world, they thanked God that it is not dead. It had a tremendous effect after the bitter days of killing and the ghetto and hunger. The new immigrants had their problems. But when Saturday night came, families and everybody loved to hear their language again. It was a treat, a medicine you give to help people stay alive. That's how she spoke. <laughs> the Dovid Hellman to Alta by Del Cadino, the most enduring of all the Yiddish theatre groups in Melbourne, was established in 1939 by Jakob Ginter. Up until 1992, this theatre group staged over 125 plays, garnering local audiences of around about 3,000. From the late 1960s, the Kadima was able to bring out guest directors such as Ruth Kaminsky and Rosa Tulkov to work with the David Hellman Theatre. The Melbourne Yiddish Youth Theatre, supported by the Kadima, was established in 1969. And if you've got really good eyes, you can see me. And for over 30 years, staged numerous plays and musicals, including Itzik Mungas Mungila, which is that. Where am I? Yeah, yeah. I'm sitting on the king's lap. I was Esther Hamakia. Okay. Um, uh, and also Sean Malachim's Der Größe Gewinns, Fiddler Boy von Dach, and translations of the Diary of Anne Frank. Look closely, you can see me. <laughs> and they also, we also did a translation of The Sunshine Boys. I was Margot, I was not Anne. My girlfriend Lily really was Anne, and she was just as well as attending the theatre, Melbourne's Yiddish community read and wrote prolifically. Between 1937 and 2006, 70 Yiddish books were published in Australia, most of them in Melbourne. Two weekly Yiddish newspapers were produced. 
die Jüdische Post und die australische Jüdische Neues. At various times, there were more than 20 other Yiddish Australian journals. Sadly, these are no more. In those days, the Yiddish audience bought literary and social criticism, school readers, rabbinical essays, descriptions of Australian Aborigines, sad tales of migrant life, memoirs, and travel diaries of life at the end of the world. Early Australian Yiddish writing is immigrant writing, often about alienation and homesickness. This theme is ever present in the wonderful poetry of Jossel Bierstein. And at this point, I would like to make mention of a film about Jossel Bierstein that is going to be shown as part of the festival, um, I think on Sunday at 8.30 here. It's called A Kush von Jerusalem, or A Kiss in Jerusalem. And I have to tell you, it's a Yiddish film with, with uh, uh, subtitles, thank you. And it is a perla. It is really such a fantastic film. And he's got such an ashamed. Um, I'd, I'd read his poetry before, but it came to life for me now, after seeing the man and seeing how he spoke, and it's just divine. Boris Sendler, who is the filmmaker, is actually here at the festival, and I urge you to go and see that film. Now that I've done that ad, we'll come back to, this, to what we're supposed to be talking about, which is Australian Yiddish writers. The short stories of life in Australian wilderness, written by Pinchas Goldhart, Josh's father, and Hertzbergner make much of Australia being Eckfeld. Esteemed writers who visited our shores also wrote about their impressions of Australian culture and society. One of these was Peretz Hirschbein, who noticed things that, that most Australians largely ignored and wrote about the suffering of war veterans and the alienation of dispossessed Aborigines. Melach Ravic, one of the greatest Yiddish writers of the 20th century, lived in Melbourne for five years from 1933. Both Hirschbein and Ravic marvelled at the vibrant Yiddish community there, so far away from the cultural centres of Warsaw and New York. Ravic made his personal contribution to the Melbourne community as editor of the first Yiddish almanac and also as the founding principal of the first Yiddish school in Australia. The E.L. Peretz Sunday and Afternoon School was opened by this fledgling, poor, but idealistic community in 1935. Its aim was to teach spoken and written Yiddish, Jewish history and Yiddish literature to immigrant children from Yiddish-speaking homes. The Sholem Aleichem Sunday School was later established south of the Yarra and to the surprise of the mainstream community became a day school in 1975 providing a secular Jewish and general education with a focus on Yiddish. The college continues today, teaching over 250 preschool and elementary school children. Melbourne's Sholem Aleichem College is one of the few remaining Yiddish day schools in the world. There is no doubt in my mind that Sholem Aleichem College is the jewel in the crown of today's Yiddish Melbourne, but perhaps I'm biased. I attended Shalom Aleichem Preschool. I was a student of both the Peretz and Shalom Aleichem Sunday Schools. I went on to become a teacher at the Sunday School and later the Day School. And after teaching elsewhere in between, I have returned home. I currently teach Grade 6 Yiddish and Jewish Studies, as well as an adult beginners class at Shalom. Both my son and daughter attended Shalom Aleichem. And since graduating from Grade 6, my daughter has returned there every week after school uh, for Yiddish classes. That's once a week. Oh, actually, it's twice a week now. She's currently studying Yiddish VCE, the highest level of study at our secondary school system, as the college runs out of hours classes in Yiddish for both adults and teenagers. While one of the smallest schools in Melbourne, Shoma Latham College punches well above its weight and has a very strong vision of being at the forefront of Yiddish cultural activity in Melbourne. At the tertiary level, there are Yiddish undergraduate students at ACJC at Monash University and next year, postgraduate students. The Jewish Museum of Australia offers popular courses about Yiddish. Both these organisations attract a wide public to lectures and events in and about Yiddish, drawing people who would not dare to step foot into those institutions usually associated with Yiddish. 
Monash University is also a supporter of YiddishPoetry.org, a website dedicated to presenting Yiddish poetry in Yiddish and in translation. There's English translation, sometimes French translation, and also Hebrew translation. Yiddish can also be heard on our national airwaves. Every week in Melbourne, one can list here three Yiddish radio broadcasts, two on government-funded ethnic radio and one on community radio. Well, all of this sounds wonderful, but I have to point out that all Yiddish courses, programs, institutions struggle to survive. They struggle for members, financial support, and to find favour in the hearts of benefactors, just like Yiddish institutions the world over. Historically, Yiddish has been nurtured by individuals of various religious and political persuasions, some even being non-aligned. These Yiddish Eastern banded together with like-minded individuals and worked tirelessly in the service of Yiddish culture. They created a number of organisations that shared the task of promoting Yiddish. However, the one organisation that I believe has been central to much of this activity in Melbourne is the Bund and its youth movement, SIF. While no longer the dynamic force that it was in its heydays of the 1950s and 1960s, the Bund and SCIF have produced dedicated activists committed to Yiddishkeit. Since the 1930s, Bundists along with other Yiddish system have been behind the establishment and running of virtually all the Yiddish activities in Melbourne. Today, the Bund has meetings in both English and Yiddish. It has a Yiddish choir called Milkum and On. It continues to run SCIF camps twice a year with some Yiddish content and it conducts weekly meetings for its youth. It is the commitment of the Bundistan and other Yiddish system that has made <coughs> Shtetl Melbourne so strong. While Yiddish was at best tolerated by the general community <coughs> and the Bundistan maligned and marginalised, the Bund and its small dedicated band of Fabrente Yiddishisten were undeterred in their work. As mentioned earlier, the Melbourne Jewish community has been more comfortable in acknowledging its Yiddish roots and the role of the Bund, as highlighted by the recent Mama Loshan exhibition and Monash University's commitment to Yiddish and to recording and documenting Yiddish Melbourne. My deepest thanks go to both these institutions as well as the Kadima for allowing me to use their research as resource material for this presentation. And my thanks also go to everyone else on the screen um, I'm glad it's not the Oscars, I don't have to read through all the thanks, but I do want to thank my, my dear friend Adam for pressing the buttons and taking that stress away from me, so thank you Adam. <laughs> Boris Sandler, editor of The Volkers, visited Melbourne in June this year as guest of Yiddish Sofov. While he dedicated five editions to his travels, here is his one-line impression. It is at the end of the world in Melbourne, Australia, that I found a tribe of dedicated modern Yiddishisten who guard the inheritance of their forebears and are committed to leave behind them another generation that will carry forth the flame of Yiddish. Thanks, Boris. But maybe words are not enough. Come and visit. See for yourself. Yep. I'm also promoting Australia on behalf of the uh, Tourism Board. No, they did not fund my trip. <laughs> However, I have enough Monis. It is no clinicate to travel some 24 hours plus to visit us in Eckveld. So here is a sneak preview of what you might find. We may or may not have time for questions, but I would like to finish my talk with a short film made by Sian Meltzer. Yes, his name is Sian and give you a taste of secular Yiddish Melbourne today. Our Frum community in Yiddish? The future of Yiddish Melbourne? Well, these are subjects for a whole other presentation. Watch this space. Wow. One last try. <coughs> 
doesn't work when we take questions. And I really got to love it. I saw the possibilities of A, reaching a large audience, uh, B, being able to use the skills of the theatre and uh, also to perpetuate the, the wonderful literature and heritage that we've got in quite an uh, easy medium. And of course, with today's technology, that has allowed us also to go into, onto the internet. And by that, we've got really, I would say, a small but a global audience. Okay, so this is our um, Yiddish immersion weekend. So ABC Studios, the National Studio. 
viewers who don't know, um, klezmer music is the music of Eastern European Jews. And of course, it was the Jews of Eastern Europe that fell victim to the Nazi atrocities of the Second World War. And we, the Jewish people, and, and um, we found ourselves to be both asylum seekers during that time and then refugees after that time, seeking a home and somewhere to, and some safe haven. And um, we were, therefore, as, as representatives of, of that generation. A language has to be spoken. If people don't speak it, that language will die. So I'll keep speaking. Oh, that's amazing. We've only got a few minutes left for questions. Um, if you have any, make them easy because I'm really not an academic. Do you want to find this book? Okay. One from each row. Yeah. Okay, for those of you who are staying, the question was that it was a very different situation. If you are staying, if you could please keep it down, thank you. Um, can't help being a teacher, can I? Um, <laughs> Uh, the situation in Sydney is different. Um, I think, and Rosita, you may want to add to this, I think the situation in Sydney is different because the Jews there were different. They were the German Jews, most of them, many of them, and Hungarian Jews who came there. And not the Polish Jews. They were already all very assimilated Jews that not, came there. And not Yiddish speaking. Well, certainly not the German Jews, and very few Hungarian Jews, unless they came from ultra-religious backgrounds, spoke Yiddish. Um, Rosita, is there anything you want to add to that? Um, the Jewish folk centre is actually found in preparation to the Polish Jews after World War II. But um, with the influx of Hungarian Jews after 1956, the continuity didn't continue. And so we've always had a problem in keeping Yiddish going in Sydney because we don't have the foundation that Melbourne has, we don't have the Jewish day school that was never set up. In the Jewish day schools in Melbourne and Sydney, Yiddish was never part of the curriculum. It was, it was, always, it was always an extra curriculum. And it was never supported by the parents. And therefore, it, the children were ostracized by other children and they went to Yiddish classes. So it was never mainstream. So we've, it's been a struggle over the years to keep Yiddish going. And um, we, we had a chair of Yiddish at Sydney University, which um, unfortunately wasn't continued at the end of 2011. And so we had Jewish students who, Yiddish students who fell through the cracks and they finished off their courses either through the um, assistance of Monash University in Melbourne or through attending summer school at Amherst. Uh, but in terms of academia, in terms of education, it doesn't exist in Sydney. And therefore, you don't have the foundation which you have in Melbourne. You don't have the youth groups in Melbourne. You don't have children in You know, you don't have the youth groups in Sydney. You don't have the schools in Sydney. And, and so it's um, a problem. The other thing is that the um, Yiddish is now being taken over by the Israelis. The Moadon that I mentioned is now Hamoadon, it's the Jewish Folk Center slash Hamoadon HaYisraeli. And I have been fighting the losing battle over the years to keep Yiddish going in Sydney. And then it's, I, I had an epiphany because I realized that um, uh, we had, after the foundation of the uh, State of Israel, Ben Gurion's philosophy was that we should not continue speaking Yiddish in Israel. Yes. We should try and encourage Hebrew. And so the members of the Moadon have come through that education stream. 
And even though some of them might be bilingual, they prefer to speak Hebrew. So that's the current scenario. I go down to um, softball in Melbourne. I've been going for three years. I've been the only one going. Now we have a girl who's a graduate of the Sydney University who comes as well. But unfortunately, she's not, she's not Jewish, but she's a graduate in Yiddish, and she will be continuing to do her master's that uh, was mentioned by Freddie next year at Monash. What's the scene? It I'm afraid familiar. that's all we, have questions, all we have time for the questions. If you see me around the place, oh, and I'm singing, oh, okay. I'm singing tomorrow night at the uh, Commonwealth Cabaret. It's a printing error in your programs. It's not the Canadian Cabaret, it's the Commonwealth <laughs> Cabaret. <laughs> I'm singing tomorrow uh, there, and I'll be around the traps, as well as introducing um, the Yossi Bilstein film. So thank you very, very much. Thank you so much.